Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in today's episode of BioWiz podcast, Meet the Wizard. I am Elizabeth, and I am happy to be here today with Fiona Muyes, the Director of Programs at the Mawazo Institute. Hi, Fiona. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Elizabeth? I'm great. Thank you very much. Fiona, I would, I would like to start by asking you what we are asking all the guests here. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey and what led you to where you are today? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so yes, where did my journey start? I think I can start by maybe introducing the project I did for my master's thesis. So I ended up, I ended up doing an undergraduate in medical genetics actually, but for my master thesis, I saw this project that just really stood out and it was a project looking at microalgae and whether we could use microalgae to produce biodiesel. And I was really fascinated with this, even just the title and then the, the short project description that was next to it. And I was, I was like, no, I think this is the one. I think it's not at all human or medical genetics, but, but I was really excited to hear that, you know, something as simple as a microalgae could be used to produce biodiesel. And that, that really just got me. I think that stems from my interest in just, you know, research and science that has an impact on people's everyday lives. And everyone uses petrol or diesel. Well, not everyone, but you know, it's something that's used every day. It's a, it's a, it's a normal commodity. So I, I immediately was interested in that. And so I started the project, did, did my master's thesis in it. It was very, you know, as, as, as far as you can take research in one year. So as with most uh, master's degrees, it's usually a year long project. So you've got a year to do research on something as complex as producing biodiesel for microalgae, you know? Um, and I felt I hadn't had enough of microalgae. And whilst I'd never prior to this, cons like prior to this point of doing a master's degree, considered doing a PhD, that wasn't something that ever was in, you know, I ne never crossed my mind. But then I saw an ad for, they were looking for a PhD student or a PhD researcher at a research station in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And this person, they were looking for somebody who could be based in industry. So you're working really um, in, in the real world, so to say, you know, it's not in a, it's not in a lab setting in a university. This is really, you know, already connecting to industry. And that's something that really appealed to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I applied. I said, you know what, I'll just give it a shot. Let's see what happens. And um, my boss to be, Julie, Julie McGuire, uh, who was the research director at this research station, um, you know, was like, you know, we would love to have you. Would you love, you know, we'd love to have you on board and come on board as a PhD student. So I did it. I, I moved to Ireland. Uh, I moved to West Cork to a small town called Bantry. Uh, and I began looking at the scaling up of microalgae and in particular a marine, a marine species. So I was looking at a diatom and looking at how we can basically scale up these cultures. How can we make this feasible? How can we produce enough microalgae that it could have, you know, it could, it could be viable to be a commodity that can be sold or at least the products from it could be sold. So, um, that's what I did. I, I looked for my PhD. My PhD research was looking at the scaling up of the algae. And one issue with scaling up is contamination. And so I kind of took a different angle to the research. So rather than just looking at population dynamics of scaling up cultures, I began looking at the bacteria that were forming in these cultures. The minute that you go outside of a conical flask, uh, there's going to be contamination, you know? <laughs> So I started looking at whether these bacterial communities could have some kind of a, almost like a probiotic effect. Is there a way that these communities could actually support the microalgae that we're cultivating? And so I did some, some work doing genetic sequencing just to do identify which bacteria were there. Uh, then looking at literature out, that's out there. I incorporated uh, some aspects of mathematical modeling. Like, could we try model these populations and find out what the different families of bacteria are doing? Like, is this a good guy? Is this a bad guy? <laughs> is this, you know, which one is actually being be is beneficial for, for, for the microalgae that I'm cultivating? Um, and it was incredible journey. Like, doing your PhD is, is crazy, you know? And the research itself is one part, but there's everything that 
I was able to do alongside the PhD. And one of those things was being more involved with like project development, project implementation. And that's where other interests started to come in. So whilst I loved my PhD thesis and I thought the research was, I really enjoyed doing it. I also started to really enjoy being involved in the more day-to-day -day running of the research station that I was working in. So I was helping with preparing pro project proposals, helping to um, put together budgets, things like that, things that are almost the complementary side of science. And so once I finished my PhD, I actually started doing more of that. So I started doing project management mm -hmm. and a lot of the projects were interdisciplinary. There was, you know, people with experts from all over. And I really enjoyed doing that connection, you know, connecting different people with different expertise and trying to see how their research can complement each other and we can do some cool, cool research and get some cool results. So that's where my interest was lying. But always in the back of my head, um, I was really interested in this translation of this research to real life. So back to that question I had during my master's, like how does this translate to the everyday person, this kind of mm -hmm. research? Is this accessible to them? Does this, can this affect their lives, their day-to-day -day lives in, in, in a certain way? And, you know, my, my heritage is, is Kenya. I was born in Kenya. Uh, my mom is Kenyan. And I always thought, it always was in the back of my head, how can I translate all of these things I've learned to working with communities here to improve their lives you know is there a way that there's there's a connection there and one thing that really always came to mind was all of these skills in terms of project management the skills of translating science and data into language that p everyday person can understand is there so why why couldn't i do do this you know and so i decided with to move <laughs> to the Comoros Islands. So we left one island to go to another island, uh, this time in the Indian Ocean. And we, I moved there with my one-year-old. My daughter was one years old when we moved out there to so a completely foreign place who had never been there, never visited before, <laughs> you know, uh, different language. So uh, the main language spoken there is French. So it was a completely different world, um, but it was incredible. Like most beautiful, most beautiful place, really stunning. And I got to work with some of the most incredible communities there, particularly uh, the fisherwomen, the fisherwomen that live on the island. They were really inspiring women. And that's where I got to translate and do exactly that. I got to work with these women, some of whom couldn't read and write, and I'm teaching them on how, you know, how to draw graphs and what does data mean? What does, when I say, you, you know, this month, uh, 20 octopus were caught. What does that mean? You know, and being able to do that and teach them and show them that this data can be so powerful and this data is only complementing what they already know. You know, they already knew that certain seasons are better than others. The data is just showing it. Um, and so I, I was working there as the marine um, program manager. So I was implementing and, you know, work that's conservation based, but and co marine conservation based but the majority of your work is really the people. So you're working mm -hmm. with the communities. So whilst we're trying to do marine conservation, it was work, it, all the work was, you know, with the communities, whether that's doing um, alternative livelihood training, whether that was teaching them about data and what data is, um, you know, these kind of things. It, yeah, it was, it was really quite incredible. And I really, really enjoyed enjoyed doing that and it really sparked this interest of novel thinking new ideas for the marine conservation space which is always science-based so mm -hmm. it's not like i have you know i'm still implementing what i have been learning and what I, all the different skills and all the knowledge that i've gained over the years just to this to a different context basically um but uh yeah so that's that's where the, and i'm still working in that space even here in kenya at the moment but the opportunity came to work with Moazo Institute. So this again is another complementary journey <laughs> that kind of matched with with my 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 values and what I believed in. And you know, being a, a woman of African heritage in in the science space, 
is such a unique thing. There's so there's not that many of us out there, you know. Um, and I think you know, as as you know, a lot of issues as a woman in science, you know, are just almost multiplied when you add the 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 um, this this different component of color, you know, of being a woman of color in science. It, it, there's there's so many stories I could say during my journey that it have happened, and it, it was not it was not always easy. Um, but you you do what you do, you know, <laughs> and you lead by example. And so what the Mawazo Institute stands for in terms of really working with supporting African women scientists, African women thought leaders, African women with great ideas. This is what the Moazo Institute stood for. And so when I had the opportunity to, to engage with them, uh, initially I'd engaged with them as a reviewer. I was reviewing some of their applications um, for some of their, their programs. Mm -hmm. So they had PhD students who had put in applications. So I'd done reviewing for them before. Um, but when this position for director of programs opened up, uh, you know, that's when I thought maybe this could be the chance to add something new to my journey. And um, that's how it kind of started. And I started there officially at the beginning of the year. So I've been there about just over, just over, yeah, four months, almost five months now. And I mean, what can I say? It's, it's a perfect fit. Like it's, it's really stands for everything that, that I believe in. And it's now merging my knowledge and expertise with my passion and my own personal values as well. So that's how my journey to becoming <laughs> the director of programs at the Moaz Institute. It just, it just sounds right. Like you, you've been on the right path all along and this is very uh, powerful and inspiring. Uh, so let's hear more about Mawazo Institute. W what does it do? How did it start? Okay, yeah. So Mawazo in Swahili means ideas. So it's the Ideas Institute. That's, that's, that's kind of the, the, the already, you know, a small glimpse into what it actually stands for. So the Mawazo Institute. And uh, it was started by two friends. So Dr. Rose Mutisu and um, Rachel St Storm. And they, start, they were friends in undergrad school mm -hmm. uh, in the States. And they saw that there was already, you know, in general, in the in the world of science, there was very few women, and there was even less women of color. Like, why is there this gap? Why does this gap exist? And so, in 2017, they started the Moazo Moazo Institute uh, as a way, as a as a place where not only we, you know we could find out exactly why this, why this gap exists, but mm -hmm. also try and close that gap. Like, what can we do? to ensure that there is more and more representation of African women in sciences. And the Moaz Institute has a few different uh, things that it wants to do to, to ensure that this, this gap is filled. And two of, the main, two of the main things that we're trying to do, number one is to improve um, not the quality, I, I don't wanna say the quality of the of the females, the African female scientists, but it's almost like improving their ability to not only do good science, but also all everything else that's complementary, helping them to be able to present their science better, giving them leadership qualities, uh, enabling them to write things like uh, op opinion pieces, being able to engage with policymakers. And, and, and turn them into scientists that are well-rounded and can really compete on a global level and mm -hmm. give them the tools they need to really be, be on that forefront, you know, to, to be able to speak up about research, uh, be, about their research and the research space in general and kind of be on the forefront of this rather than just being in, you know, be, being in the lab, doing the research, really taking that research and translating it into selling it to the wider public so that there's more and more representation of African women standing up, talking about research. Um, the other side, which is very closely linked is this public engagement. Mm -hmm. So just, and this is not only for, you know, early career PhD student, uh, early postdoc researchers. This is just for, even for experts, so African women experts to be able to be, be seen more, you know, 
and give them this platform where the, whether whether that's through podcasts, whether that's through writing blogs, whether that's through doing you know short films, things like that, but really moving them into the mainstream so that the everyday person sees more and more African women scientists in their in their in, you know in all in their general uh uh yeah, in their, in, in their social media or in their the TV that they're watching, the radio that they're listening to, to be able to hear and see these voices. And the whole thing behind that is really, we want to show young African girls that there's people who look like you in these, in these spaces. They are there, you know? They're, they have voices that people are listening to. They are the ones who are helping to really try and change policy that actually addresses issues that affect African women, not just policies that are just being made in an office somewhere on a round table. You know, these are real issues that are felt by by the people themselves mm -hmm. or by the women themselves. So that's the kind of the two way approach that that are very much complementary and are completely intertwined. But those are the two main pillars of what Moazo wants to do. Amongst all those women, all the scientific women that you are helping on a day-to-day -day basis, do you encounter different industries? Are you more focused on a specific industry? How, how, you were talking earlier about the fact that you, you were uh, used to be the gap between different industries. So I'm curious to know if this is also something that you are a skill that you're using at uh, Mawazo. Yeah, so... Not in the same way. I wouldn't say it's done exactly in the same way, but the, the PhD fellows that we have at the moment on our fellowship program come from a variety of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say maybe majority of them are working in, in fields that are very much, you know, addressing things like food security. Um, so whether looking at uh, more drought resilient strains or things like that, there's, there's quite a big representation of that, but that's because I think a lot of funding comes through for that mm -hmm. kind of research, you know. But we also have people who are doing, you know, women's studies. There's, I think we have a PhD student who's doing astrophysics. Like it's, it, it's very, it's quite, it's quite diverse. Wow. And mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And that, that for me is really exciting to see, really exciting to see because we've put all these, these PhD students from different institutions in East Africa working on different things, but we've put them in one space. So, virtually anyway but <laughs> put them in one one space where they can talk to each other they can share ideas they can share um complementary knowledge so if, if somebody you know and that's coming from my own experience when i didn't do mathematical modeling at all you know but because i was able to engage with mathematical model modelers and speak their language so to speak we were able to collaborate and do some really cool research and i, I mean i didn't have to learn how to become a mathematical modeler i just had to know how to communicate and interact and work and collaborate with them. And so we hope that we're able to do that also for, for the fellows, um, you know, to, to, to really allow them to interact with each other beyond this fellowship program. When they of finish course. this fellowship program, we hope that we have this network that they, mm -hmm. they can always tap into. So if everyone, if, if anytime somebody has a question about something that's very specific, not their expertise, but it's very specific, that we have this network that they can tap into you know, to, to find out. So I really, you know, I, that interdisciplinary thinking is still there. I really still really want to push for it. And um, yeah, yeah, so it's still there, yeah. <laughs> so what are currently the next steps? What is uh, ahead for Moazo? So for Moazo, for the, the next few years, I, you know, we're, see, we're foreseeing a lot of growth we want to expand the fellowship program that we have at the moment to include a few different elements so we would love to have a, a small grants facility for for the researchers so that you know this is always this is and you know we do a lot of surveys and and, and studies internally in Moazo and one of the main issues that comes up whenever we talk to PhD students in the region is lack of funding you know if they want to do a, a a special test, they want to do genetic sequencing or something like that, they, it's hard. They don't have the funding for it. And a, a lot of times they're also self-funded. Uh, they've got other commitments. They have, a lot of them have young families, things like that. So you can imagine how, how stretched they must be. 
And so we would love to have a small grants facility that would allow them to apply for whether that's, you know, to travel somewhere to do a secondment, to go to a conference, to get um, special equipment or testing done or something like that. We would love to have something there that they could be able to tap into. And since we would already have a network, like we would already have done the first step almost of, of um, um, our due diligence. You know, these people are already our fellows. These students would already be one of our one of our fellows. And so we would already, there's already that element of trust Mm -hmm. um there and so we would love to have that um we would also like to possibly tap into the next stage what happens when you finish your phd what mm -hmm. what comes next um a lot of phd students sometimes uh feel they come out of a phd and it's like uh, now what do i do you know <laughs> i have to go try find either a postdoc do i want to go into industry what do i want to do you know do i follow the traditional sense towards becoming a professor do i want to switch and opening up that world so that they can see that as a PhD, getting a PhD, that your world is your oyster. You can do what whatever you want, you know? And we would love to maybe engage with other organizations to, to facilitate maybe secondments or internships or, you know, things like that. So that we they already have somewhere where they can get some experience to build up their CVs and stuff to, to get jobs, the job of their dreams, basically. <laughs> um, we would also love to continue building our public engagement, like the public engagement work last year with, with the pandemic basically was stopped. And so we're just about restarting that now. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of things have now gone virtual. We were having live events. So we'd have, uh, we, we used to call them Nairobi Idea Nights. So it's like these nights where anybody who was just interested in learning about science would come and would have different researchers talk about their research. And we kind of in this very relaxed, um, informal atmosphere uh, and would love to still do that, whether that has to be virtual initially uh, until things, um, yeah, until we, we find a way to be able to do it uh, <laughs> in person. Um, that's one thing, yeah. And so podcasts, we're, we're redoing, we're restarting our podcast series. Um, we've got different themes that we want to do for the next year. And so we'll have different experts coming to talk on the podcast. We'll have a digest that we're going to be publishing. We have an ebook coming out. Um, so those kind of things is something we want to definitely, you know, amp up. Uh, I think it's, it's very, um, it's very powerful. I think in, in the past uh, we had, um, we, we, for, as an example, we had we'd created a book um, called Science Kibao, and Kibao is like a slang word in Swahili for like a lot, like science, like a lot of science. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole, and it was, I think we had like the greatest hits on it, like it's a like an e-magazine, and it was all these cool things that were done in Kenya first, mm -hmm. um, that that people that even Kenyans would not even know about, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was all of these cool kind of nerdy things that science that, that that people in Kenya did first that we didn't know about so the, these 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 kind of things I think are quite powerful for increasing the um, amount of well increasing the, the audience imp increasing the amount of people that we're reaching who are interested in science just don't know where to find it or only are consuming kind of stuff from abroad uh, mm -hmm. and now trying to create something that's more related to the local context. Um, yeah, but I think we'd probably like to do more of that too, yeah. <laughs> it's also very important to underline the fact that the Mawazo Institute is an NGO. I don't know if we say that at any point, but Sorry, you no. Guys, no, that I just realized it, but you guys, you are an NGO. Uh, so, of course, that means a lot of challenges on the way when it comes to funding and when it comes to the fact that all those initiatives are strictly to help the woman scientist community. So it's quite impressive. And I would like to ask you in that regard, what would you have to say to a bioethical system? How, how, what do you need as an NGO today? I think what we really need for now is, 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 is to expand this network that we're creating. I think that network is so, so, so powerful, not only for Moazo as an institution, like if we could reach more and more experts who could 
potentially become mentors, for example. We've got a mentorship program. We would love to have more experts become mentors. Mm -hmm. Um, we would love to expand our reach on in terms of experts that we could have come talk uh, on really you know different issues and different themes that we would like to highlight. Um, that's definitely one part as an institution, but also for our beneficiaries, you know, our fellows that we have, if they are able to be connected to this this ecosystem and this network, that would be incredible. This would be really incredible, and if it could increase their potential. Uh, reach in terms of jobs or postdoc positions in the future, that would be ideal, really, really ideal. Um, yeah, yeah, that's where I could see, you know, the the, the BioWeeds ecosystem being merging, coming together with the Mawazo, <laughs> the Mawazo world. Yeah, that sounds great. Do you have any last thing that you would like to discuss with us? That uh, any project, any upcoming event that you want to let us know about? We have we have this uh, ebook coming out. It's called the it's it's a women in science ebook. And we had a focus this this year for this for this ebook to really put the spotlight on African women scientists working in you know working in the world of coronavirus and COVID-19 and, and the, pan, the pandemic, what it, has, what, mm -hmm. what it has brought to us, you know. Um, so these are a mixture of women. So some are really, you know, on the front lines, they're, they're medical uh, practitioners, whether they're working in hospitals and doing research uh, alongside. Uh, but they're also um, women using different approaches, you know, using things like Again, again, I'll mention mathematical modeling, but there is somebody there that's that that that, that is you know using mathematical modeling to to do research on different aspects of the pandemic, um, and we wanted to highlight them because these are women that are also rising stars in a way. They mm -hmm. are up and coming. They're younger. They're younger researchers, younger doctors who are doing really cool stuff. Um, there is a few uh, of them who are coming who, from uh, from Tanzania, where you know there's been a lot of political stuff around coronavirus not even being there. So it's always been very interesting to find out how how have they been able to continue doing research or treat mm -hmm. COVID nineteen patients, given that their government isn't supporting them, you know, mm -hmm. on this. So that that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to use this as an opportunity to really um highlight and showcase uh, and applaud the work that they're doing um so that ebook should be coming out in may towards the end of may i'd say um we're just doing now the final uh interviews with the finalists and, and things like that so it's still being put together but it's it would be very it would be yeah it'd be cool if, people, if it reached more and more people to, that's to great see. Yeah, yeah. that's great Thank you so much, Fiona, for being here, for telling us all about your journey and the amazing job that you are doing at the Mawazo Institute. You are welcome at any time to tell us more about uh, how things are going over there. Thank you so much for having me. 